Welcome to Fraud Talk, the ACFE's monthly podcast. I'm Cora Bullock, assistant editor of Fraud Magazine. This month, I interviewed Paul Wiseman, a private investigator in the UK, about a fraudster who couldn't help but skim a little off the top from his family and friends. Paul is owner of Paul Wiseman Investigations, which works with clients to establish ethical anti-fraud policies, perform risk assessments, and conduct fraud examinations. So how did you first become involved with the investigation into Graham Peter Barnett's criminal activities? My client, Mr. Uh, Graham Smith, the proprietor of the bakery, about 12 months earlier, he'd been advised by his accountant that there was 16% downturn in the turnover on the previous year. His accountant asked him to check various things, such as was there excess wastage of the products, were there any increases in the cost of raw materials that hadn't been passed on on to the customer, was he carrying excess stock, that sort of thing, which he duly checked and found nothing untoward whatsoever. Through that process of elimination, his accountant suggested he check the, uh, that the shortfall may be in the sales invoices, at which point he called me in, um, because by this time he had suspicions about um, one of his um, employees. So he called me in in April 2011. Uh, basically, this guy's job, he'd been working for the bakery owner for, and he was incidentally his first cousin. He'd been working for him for about three and a half years. In fact, he'd begged him for, for, for a job because uh, he, he'd suddenly uh, finished at his previous job. Now, this guy was also um, an ex-bank manager. He was the treasurer of the local cricket club and had been for approximately 30 years. Uh, and he was he was regarded by everyone that that knew him as an upstanding um, well well regarded regarded member of the community subsequently as the investigation um, progressed very few people believed that he could actually um, be involved in anything like this I was called in in April 2011 um, immediately started checking the what his job was, uh, which was basically he was a part-time, he, he worked part-time, about 16 hours a week, perhaps 20 hours some weeks. He collected cash from customers, also delivered bread to them. He did all the invoicing for the company and also did all the banking. He did everything, yes. Yeah, so you can see where this is going, can't you? Basically, they're all, they, were, they were just invoice books um, with duplicated um, pages. So the um, the van driver would deliver the bread to the customer. It would be the the, the what the um, what he delivered be listed in the invoice book. At the end of the month, or sometimes at the end of the week, the the, the customer would, would pay either with a check or cash. Some pay, paid by bank transfer, um, but in this particular instance, the money he stole was cash. Although he did pay checks in, into the the uh, bank company bank account as well. So basically, I got all the invoice books going back for the, from the time he started, and I got all the bank statements, all the paying in books to the bank, and I, and I put it all on a spreadsheet, which gave us a, gave us a very good and, and accurate kicking off figure, which um, I estimate uh, was just over forty forty four thousand pounds over the three and a half years. Wow. This, is, um, this bakery must have been doing really well. He was doing quite very well indeed. Um, now this guy was due to go on holiday on a, um, a two-week Caribbean cruise with his wife. We thought, yeah, let's let him go on that holiday. So we let him go on the holiday, and in the meantime, uh, basically we did a lot more um, investigating so that we had a pretty solid case against him. So he did uh, not realize that he was being investigated? He did not realize at this point in time that he was being investigated. But what I did do, uh, the day he came back on the Sunday, on, on the following Monday, I turned, he didn't normally work Mondays, I turned up um, at his house with a, a letter addressed to him, and that was a letter advising him that he was under suspension whilst allegations of theft made against him were being investigated. And what was his reaction? Uh, quite, one of shock. Mm-hmm. He, this, this is a guy, I mean, this guy was 65 years old at this time. I don't think you suddenly become a thief at the age of 65. I think he'd been doing it for an awful long time. Then, basically, we we were at this stage, we were still in the um, employee disciplinary process um, because I was conscious that um, we had to 
uh, follow the, re the regulations as far as employment law was concerned. Because what we didn't want is once he had been dismissed, we didn't want him to go to an employee, employee tribunal, get a payout because we'd done something procedurally wrong. So I was very conscious that we had to get this part right. So three days after giving him the um, letter of suspension, I called him in to an interview. I recorded the interview. The interview lasted uh, about 25 minutes before he got, got up and walked out. Then we held a formal uh, disciplinary meeting, which he didn't attend, but we dismissed him in his absence anyway. We wrote to, to him telling him he'd been dismissed, dismissed and the reasons why. We gave him a week's um, leeway to appeal against the decision, which he didn't do. Um, and at that point, I took um, what's known in the UK as Section 9 statements from all the witnesses, including myself. And I made a, an appointment to see the local police and presented my evidence to them. Um, I, ironically, the, the, the sergeant who took the, my statements and my complaint, his first words were um, an expletive, <laughs> followed by, I, I used to play cricket with this guy. And then we had a real stroke of luck. Uh, basically, there was a, a police lady called PC Lisa Bullock who was on uh, light duties after, after following an operation, and she was allocated to our case. Mm -hmm. And she was absolutely brilliant all the way through. Um, and at that point, I, I happened to know the chairman of the local cricket club for which Peter Barnett was the treasurer and had been for 30 years. And I, I, um, I explained to him what we'd done. He couldn't believe it. And he, he said, well, what should we do? And I said, well, I think you'd better call a committee meeting for which Peter Barnett will have to attend as he's the treasurer. I said, at that committee meeting... Um, uh, explain that there's been allegations made and what for the whilst the investigation is going on that you were going to suspend him from the um, the treasurer ship um, and I said and then when you've done that go with him back to his house and collect all the property of of the cricket club meaning all the um, all the paying in books again all the financial uh, type stuff mm -hmm. um, now they did the first thing and they suspended him but they didn't go back and collect all the um, all the financial stuff. Why did they not do that? Um, I think it was a it was a case of they. A lot of the committee didn't couldn't believe that he was um, he'd done it basically that he'd stolen from them or he may have stolen from them. Um, so and it was simple as that. Um, but, but and basically he just destroyed everything. Uh. Um, so they could only they could only go back three years. And they, re they also reported him to the police, uh, and the police arrested him on that um, theft as well. He was found guilty, I think it was, well, he, he eventually admitted both crimes, mm -hmm. but only r right at the, um, 11, on the, at the 11th hour base, really. So he put, he put the victims and the, and, the, and the witnesses to his crime, he put them through quite um, a torrid time, basically, because... At the beginning, nobody believed them because he was such a, he was an ex-bank manager, he was an upstanding member of the community. Um, there, were, we, we got, there, was, there was a lot of pressure, because um, it's a small community, so there was a lot of pressure to, to, um, that nobody believed the people who were making the accusations, but they tended to, to believe Peter Barnett because of who he was. Hmm. But we got over that. Yeah. Did you have a moment where you thought, I've, I've got this guy, in, in, which, in which the evidence was irrefutable? Yeah. Um, well, the, as I was building the spreadsheet and getting, getting the spreadsheet to balance, um, it was, you know, it's patently obvious. There was no, there was no one, he, he, the way he did it was quite, he was quite arrogant about it, basically, because he just, he signed the, he signed the invoices to say he'd, had the, he'd collected the money from the um, bakery's customers. He just simply skimmed it off the top, but that, the money was already on the book, so it was going to be. It was going to come to light. It was just his. Uh, he was so arrogant, I think. Uh -huh. The um, the bakery's accounting system was quite chaotic, to say the least, for for various reasons, um, and he took advantage of it. Um, I think the the real eureka moment was during the the interview. Um, I threw at him a question. I said, 
Peter, you realise it's £40,000, don't you, that we're talking about? And his first reaction was, um, no, it's not that much. I mean, my immediate thought was, the next question has got to be, um, well, how much do you think it is? But I thought, <laughs> no, if I say that, he's going to get up and walk out. Um, so I didn't. I just carried on with the interview. In actual fact, five minutes later, he did get up and walk out. He's guilty of two gross breaches of trust, both with the, his employer and with the cricket club, for which he was treasurer. So for, for those breaches of trust, I think um, he should, he should to do jail time. I hope he does. Do you think he was stealing from other employers as well? I can't comment on that because oh. inquiries are, are continu continuing. You wrote in your blog that there was overwhelming evidence of his guilt. Can you describe what that was? During his first interview with me, he, he first of all said, well, I didn't collect any money from all of these people. Um, and then sort of as the interview progressed and I presented evidence to him that he had collected from these people, um, he changed his story again. He kept on changing his story all the way through from not collecting any money to collecting all of the money. And, and he basically did exactly the same with, with the um, police interviews. He started out saying, well, I didn't collect um, all of the money from all of the people. And then uh, at a second interview, he collected some of the money from some of the people. And then after the third interview, he collected all of the money. <laughs> so he, he's, he's um, I got to know this guy very well over the last three years. And he's the kind of person, he, he, he think, he's a very intelligent person. He thinks ahead all the time. And he's always thinking damage limitation. He, once he was caught, um, his, his next thought was, how do I limit the damage? Mm -hmm. So consequently, with the um, cricket club where he destroyed all the books, they could only go back three, three years. They couldn't go back 30 years. So he was only um, charged with stealing £4,000 from them. I suspect it was uh, probably ten, 10 times that amount. You, you had written in your blog that he was a man who didn't care who he stole from. I firmly believe in this particular instance that um, he has no concept of right or wrong. I, th I think those two things just don't exist in his mind. He, when he looks at someone, he's got no friends. He's got acquaintances, but he hasn't got friends. Mm -hmm. um, he's, I think back, he's, he, he, always sort of, he was always stood on the fringe of any gathering, just looking in. I think he carefully chose his victims. He looked for people who were vulnerable. He looked for people whose perhaps financial um, dealings were a little bit chaotic. And he, and he looked for opportunities. And once he spotted someone that, um, he, as with his uh, first cousin, the owner of the bakery, um, his, his father had just died, his, his son was working in the business, he'd broken his leg, he was under tremendous pressure from a, from a, a work perspective. Um, he let the um, invoicing fall back a little bit, quite a lot, and along comes Peter Barnett with uh, the, the knight in shining armor, I can do that for you, <laughs> I'll do that, oh, so I won't, don't you worry, worry about going to the bank, I'll do all that for you, oh. and that's what he did. Um, so he took advantage you... of people's, uh, uh, he just took advantage of people. When he went to the Crown Court with the, with, with the bakery, um, he was actually charged by the uh, CPS with stealing £27,000. Um, they picked that figure out of the spreadsheet. Because um, some of the invoices he hadn't signed, so they picked the ones that he had signed and it came to £27,000. But he actually only admitted to, at the 11th hour, to stealing £4,750, um, which the CPS accepted that admission, as long as he pleaded guilty for that, but with the proviso that under proceeds of crime legislation, they would have a, a proceeds of crime um, hearing a couple of weeks after sentencing so that, uh, uh, and, and um, get the £27,000 off him. Mm -hmm. uh, but that leaves us, I, I think, with, with, with costs, with accountants' costs, my costs, solicitors' costs, we're still going to be about £23,000 short, so we will uh, probably sue him through the civil courts for that. Once, once he's been sentenced, a month later, we'll, we'll be able to have access to all the um, evidence that the police used. Okay. And, so, and that's just for the bakery and the cricket 
club, correct? Yeah. There are rumors that he left the bank under a cloud. I don't know. I can't prove that. Right. Banks are um, quite secretive with, uh, with these sort of things. They tend just to, to get rid of them. People like to steal from them and not make a fuss about it and not um, prosecute them. So, but we'll never know. When you first met him, did you, what, what did you think of him? I've, I've known him personally for probably 20 years. Oh, really? Before, long yeah, before the not, investigation? Not, not as an acquaintance or um, as a friend, but I knew, I knew that he was the treasurer of the cricket club. Um, I, knew, I knew of him. I'd seen him around, and if I saw him in the street, I, we, we would just say hello, you know, and goodbye. That was it. So I, did know, I, I have known him for quite a while. Ed's reputation was always impeccable. Um, as I say, he was a, a, a fine, upstanding member of the community. In, in your opinion, how do you think these frauds could have been prevented by the various entities? This particular fraud could have been uh, prevented if the bank that originally employed him had been more open. Um, the companies that, had, that subsequently employed him, if they'd had um, proper, proper controls, if they'd... Uh, had a, um, a proper risk management strategy, mm -hmm. um, then he, he, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been able to do it. Mm -hmm. But put yourself in, the, in, in uh, the bakery owner's position. He was, he was under pressure. His father had just died. His son, working for the business, had a broken leg. He was under tremendous pressure. Along came his first cousin, who was an ex-bank manager, he trusted him. Why wouldn't he trust him? It's had a tremendous emotional effect on uh, everyone involved, I think. Um, especially, it, 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 what people, a lot of people don't realize is even the, the bakery customers who'd given this guy money in payment of, of, of their bread, um, even they were qu quite um, emotionally scarred by it all. Because what he was effectively saying initially was, you didn't give me any money, ergo you're the um, you're the one that's stolen it. You're the thief. So it's not just the victim that's the um, that that's emotionally scarred. Do you think electronic record keeping could have been an effective control in preventing this fraud? Well, it, in, in effect, it was it was the electronic controls of the the um, the bakery's company uh, accountants that um, red flagged the, the the problem. Ah. Um, the first hint of the problem was, hey, your, your turnover is 16% down on the previous year. Where's the money gone? Paul's thorough and careful fraud examination was key in bringing this fraudster to justice. Thank you to Paul for sharing his story, and thanks for listening to Fraud Talk. You can find all of our fraud talks at acfe.com slash podcast. of the problem was, hey, your, your turnover is 16% down on the previous year. Where's the money gone? Paul's thorough and careful fraud examination was key in bringing this fraudster to justice. Thank you to Paul for sharing his story, and thanks for listening to Fraud Talk. You can find all of our fraud talks at acfe.com slash podcast. <laughs>